All right, we're on Grass Hill Farm. We're visiting a farm with my friend I from I Get Cabra Ranch, my yes, mentor. Sir. This is this farm is always one of our goals to visit this farm. Because awesome. We've always watched it. He has a satellite farm in Trinidad. So now we want to see exactly how he set up, how he does what he does. So All right, awesome. Tuned. First thing with biosecurity, everybody puts on boots. Second thing, everybody puts on gloves. Third thing, everybody gives me their wallet. Whoa, <laughs> I forgot my wallet. So Ray, you can give him your wallet, okay? I love that. Uh, some people don't call me Lloyd Wick. Some people call me Prince Charming. All right, Prince yeah. Charming. Appreciate the time, okay? Okay. Hello to Dr. Gabby. Hello to to, uh, to Mike Moda. Hello to Desmond at the college. So how much goats do we have here? We have a thousand goats. We're only milking about 300 right now. We have another 200 due in the fall. We get a premium in Ontario, 10% premium for fall milk. And we typically will sell 200 uh, breeding females every year and about 100 breeding bucks. We don't sell small bunches. We usually sell one or two large, what I call nucleus herds. Well, this is our nucleus herd, but mm -hmm. from this one, we've set up a nucleus herd in Trinidad and we're setting one up in Kenya this year, and uh, next year we'll be setting one up in uh, the United States, in Louisville. And when are you setting one up in Jamaica? As soon as I get that wallet. <laughs> usually uh, a pink mark means treatment, and a dark blue mark or a dark red mark means that they need foot trimming. And you know, at breeding season, then we have different marks for, for, for breeding depending on whether it's going to be morning or evening. Okay, so how is the separation here? Because I noticed there's one, two, three, four, three pens on this side and three on here, but they're different sizes. How do yeah, you separate? So this pen here is the freshest doles that uh, this pen here is probably averaging about five, between five and five and a half liters per day. Mm -hmm. And so they get fed a little better. And then the next pen are goats that kitted back mm -hmm. in February, March. Mm -hmm. And so they, uh, they have a little better body condition. And then the far pen are goats that have been milking over a thousand days. So we like uh, one of our strategies in breeding is we want goats that will milk a thousand days nonstop. A thousand days nonstop. So, so, you're so you don't breed goodness. them in between that? Yeah, sometimes. <clears throat> so. So when is that those? You said over there has been milking for over a thousand days, right? Yeah. So have they been... going to get bred next month. Okay, so they haven't been bred for over three years. So on this side, then uh, this first pen here are all goats that we're getting ready to picture. For the guys in Europe have all got brothers or uh, have bought and semen from brothers and whatnot to okay. those particular goats. Okay. And then the next bunch are uh, goats that uh, have been milking uh, about a year. Uh -huh. And we will separate that bunch out oh, probably about October. And half of them will end up getting bred in November. The other half will become part of our long milker group. And that's so we have three DNA things that we have worked with. So our whole herd carries a scrapey resistant gene. Mm -hmm. We're the only herd in North America, maybe the only herd in the world that has a total herd with scrapey resistance. 
we identified that gene 12 years ago. And since then, we've only used semen from uh, bucks to carry it. So you don't do natural breeding, you do... No, AI? we do mostly natural, but we oh. do some AI. Okay. And then almost all of our young goats, the ones uh, three years old and younger, carry a caffeine A gene, which means you get uh, between 10 and 12% higher cheese yield per kilo of milk because the caffeine A is the clotting gene in the milk mm -hmm. that makes it curd. Mm -hmm. And now we're working with the Aaron lady that did her presentation on, uh, on the persistency gene. So about half of our herd goes back to two main families and they will melt forever. Wow. Our best old goal has 21,000 kilos of milk and 17 kids. And she never went dry from the time she kitted at 14 months until we put her down at 14 years. Wow. So I'll explain why that's so important. Okay. And then the far pen are, uh, are dolings that are uh, that didn't get bred for this year and uh, they will be most of them will be a year old right shortly this is my daughter we have a very good relationship she works in my car <laughs> question now yeah. how often do you change a bed in? uh three four times a year Okay. Right now they all need to be done. Uh, like we bid every Monday, Wednesday, Friday with the straw chopper. Right. But we clean the pots out. Uh, usually, well, Tim will, well, you're, you're living up here. We usually get a January thaw. Yeah. When the weather turns warm for about 10 days. Mm -hmm. So we, we clean out then, we clean out in the spring, and then we'll clean out about now. Okay. So as soon as we finish second cut hay here in the next two or three days, we got the straw all bailed. Then the next job will be hooking up the nurse better and uh, we'll clean all these pens out. And uh, we'll compost all the dirt in there. So what's the dimension of this barn? This barn is, uh, the dimensions of this barn is $112,000. Okay, and uh, in terms of feet, what I oh, got feet? The, <laughs> uh, uh, 66 feet wide and 200 feet long. For a thousand bucks. Wow. Then the hay barn at the far end is uh, 60 feet wide and 120 feet long. And the goats in it. And then the old cow barn is uh, another 200 feet yeah. and that's where the dry doves and the bucks are okay and then we have what i call mary grove which is uh, to the north out here mm -hmm. where the bucks that the breeding where you breed them well yeah they're the older bucks I call it Mary Grove because they don't get much activity anymore. <laughs> and on the north end, they get the cold shoulder, right? Uh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, okay. Yeah. So typically, you asked about the AI. Mm -hmm. Because we're a breeding herd and we're trying to, to uh, you know, like you see that go there with her head down? Yeah. With the big full rear udder? Mm -hmm. Like, she's... Uh, She's probably giving her about seven, seven and a half kilos right now. And she's been melting uh, her, her son we're using right, well, will be shortly. And he was born on the uh, 27th of August last fall. So she's been melting a year now. Wow. I never so, heard that before. Yeah. So. We're using her son on a bunch of what I call the short season goats. The short season goats are ones that only want to milk 400 days. If you look behind Tim, 
So that cow was one of our world champions that we bred. Mm -hmm. I think we've had four, yeah, four world champion cows and three world champion goats. All of those calves come out of two embryos. Oh. So that's the next step in the goat world is embryo transfer. And we want to establish as many DNA uh, markers before we start embryo transfer as possible. So when you look at the world, and I don't care whether we're talking him meat goats or dairy goats, the, what I call the spoiled world, the rich world, uh, the, the privileged world, you know, North America, Northern Europe, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, where all the money is. There is really no big future in making genetic improvement, especially in the cows in those worlds. Like, you know, the best cow that I have at the cow farm down the road, or the best cow that somebody in D.C. or Washington State has, is almost an identical pedigree to the best cow in Germany, or the best cow in Japan, or the best cow in Northern Ireland. So, the future of the gold world is in uh, 10 degrees latitude both sides of the equator, which is the Caribbean, most of Africa, Southeast Asia, India, Pakistan, China. That's where all the population is. The majority of the people in those countries are somewhat lactose intolerant. Goats are much more water efficient than cows. And all of those countries have water problems. Uh, like I know Jamaica has water problems because when I go to Jamaica, nobody ever drinks water. They all drink rum and whatnot in the day. <laughs> <laughs> so I know water is really scarce down there. Okay, okay. But so so when you look at that ten degrees in there, the majority of the dairy business and the meat business, but I'm particularly talking about dairy, is backyard farms. Well what happens and I got educated about this for the first time in Vietnam, is the government, whatever development, FAO, United Nations, you know, trying to help these poor families to put good food into their kitchen table to feed their kids, they want to, uh, to make it sustainable. So your typical group goes especially the floppy-eared Nubians, like they will milk about 125 days and then they go dry. So the government, university, FAO, take this poor lady with four kids, put 15 goats in her backyard, she works her butt off to do a good job looking after them, convinces all her neighbors to become customers, and does really well, and then halfway through the year, the goats all go dry, her customers all go somewhere else. If these goats will milk all year, then she builds her customer base year by year by year. So when I was in Vietnam the first time, that's 10 years ago now doing dairy workshops, and I paid their lot. He didn't end up charging me because I told him enough stories that he thought he had fun. <laughs> but uh, we went out because I said, listen, I hear so much about these backyard dairies, I want to go and talk to a couple of the people when I don't have, you know, ministry people hanging over my shoulder and whatnot because I want to get the real story. So he said, I take you to two farms. That's all we got time for you know, before you have to speak at the banquet tonight. And the first farm was really nice, but she was quite hesitant talking to an outsider. 
the second farm shaped a lot of the things that I tried to do. So she had five kids and she had 15 goats in the backyard. And she had already used one generation of uh, artificial insemination on a United Nations project. So her goats that she was milking were 50% uh, upgraded. And so I said, okay, simple, what difference does this really make from genetics? She said, with my old goats, I could afford to feed my kids. With these goats, I can put my kids through university. And, and what, what, what was the new? So the new goats were 50% AI fired mm -hmm. from high persistent goats. Okay. And she says the key thing isn't the fact that I'm getting four liters a day for peak production instead of two liters a day. The key thing for me is that at Christmas time, I've got the same amount of milk to sell as what I had at Easter. And she said, the persistency of the goats is what really makes the difference for me being able to have an economically valuable business. So this okay. was this sun and in, sun and yeah. semen that you injected? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So how is your performance in Trinidad? Are you getting 400 days? Or are you getting a, a thousand days? So, so to me, that really shaped my way of thinking. Mm -hmm. The goats in Trinidad, two questions. You wanted to know how persistent they were down there. Mm -hmm. And then yes. the next question, you want to know whether the heat bothered them. Well, That's and, what everybody asked me. Okay, <laughs> but I was asking also the eel compared to what you're getting here. Yeah. Your, your lowest goat from the sounds of it is 400 days and your your good goat is a thousand days so how does that compare well so a thousand days up doesn't doesn't mean she melts a thousand days and then she goes dry that means that she will melt a thousand days but most of those goats will kid at least once and maybe twice during that thousand days right so like my world champion goat that had 21,000 kilos of milk mm -hmm. she had 17 kids mm -hmm. so saturday she would have four kilos 4.2 kilos or whatever on milk mm -hmm. and she'd start to look a little fussy and i would put her in the kidding pen because i knew about when she was due and Sunday morning, she'd have two babies. She never had triplets. Only once, she only had a single. So mm -hmm. she would have two babies. Sunday night, I would melt her out in a normal roll. And usually, I would leave her one more day, and then she would go back in the big milk tent. Mm -hmm. But she would never miss a day's milk. Okay. And wow. So, but if you're going to do that, you have to totally change your whole philosophy about how you manage a dairy herd. So everything we do here is based on body conditions for it. So you never dry off your doors before you breed them? Uh, very, very, very seldom. Mm. Uh, and we don't look at a calendar with a goat if I breed my goat with a body score of three, I'm going to be really, really lucky if that goat makes three healthy kids and kids with a body score that's anything over about a 2.8. The other thing that happens... So, stick with me, what's your ideal body score to breed them? I don't like to breed anything that's less than a 3.1. I like, I prefer a 3.2. Okay. And if that means that I milk my goat for 550 days before I breed her, then I'll milk her 550 days. So everything I do is based on body sport. So that, that's the way we manage it. That's, that's the cool note for it. Uh, yeah.